Hey guys, welcome and welcome back to my channel. My name is Mikey. You guys are rocking with me and Mikey's Intellectual Corner. On today's episode, we're going to be continuing our history of Russia. This will be part four. So we're just going to go dive right into it. Let's go. Eighteen twenty five. Victory over Napoleon had confirmed Russia's status as a world power. But there was discontent within Russia amongst intellectuals and army officers, some of whom had formed secret societies to plot the overthrow of Russia's autocratic system. When Emperor Alexander was succeeded, not as expected by his brother Constantine, but by a younger brother Nicholas, one of these secret societies used the confusion to launch a military coup. But the Decemberist Revolt, as it became known, was defeated by Loyalist troops, and the ringleaders were hanged. Others were sent... It's kind of sad, though, that that was, part, you know, one of a way that they could have, you know, broken away from this freaking serfdom society a whole hundred years before, you know what I'm saying, it really got bad and, you know, we got the USSR and all that stuff. Ringleaders were hanged. Others were sent into internal exile in Siberia. This was to become a common sentence for criminals and political prisoners in Tsarist Russia. Nicholas went on to adopt an official doctrine of orthodoxy, autocracy and nationality. The state was to rest on the pillars of church, Tsar and the Russian national spirit, a clear rejection of the values of European liberalism. In the Caucasus, border clashes with Persia led to a war which ended in complete Russian victory. And you know that th those people in the region were probably pretty pissed off about this because you got to think everybody in that region, I'm pretty sure, is of uh, you know Muslim, you know, faith and stuff. So they now they're having to get absorbed into a orthodox, you know, society. Probably not the, you know, obviously not the best thing, but you know. War which ended in complete Russian victory. The Treaty of Turkmenchai forced Persia to cede all its territories in the region to Russia and pay a large indemnity. Russian support for Greece in its war of independence against the Ottomans led to war between Russia and the Ottoman Empire. Russian victory brought further gains in the Black Sea region. A Polish revolt, led by young army officers, was crushed by Russian troops. Alexander Pushkin, Russia's greatest poet, was shot in a duel, and two days later died from his wounds. Nicholas sent troops to help put down a Hungarian revolt against Austrian rule. The Emperor's willingness to help suppress liberal revolts won him the nickname the Gendarme, or Policeman of Europe. Russia's first major railway was opened, connecting St. Petersburg and Moscow. Alexander Herzen, a leading intellectual critic of Russia's autocracy, emigrated to London, where he continued to call for reform in his homeland. He'd later be described as the father of Russian Socialism. The Ottoman Empire, now known as the sick man of Europe, reacted to further Russian provocations. Yeah, they're definitely struggling right now. The uh, Ottoman Empire, you can definitely see their horrible decline as well at this time. By declaring war, the Russian Black Sea Fleet inflicted a crushing defeat on the Turks at the Battle of Sinope. But Britain and France, alarmed at Russia's southern expansion and potential control of Constantinople, declared war on Russia. The Allies landed troops in Crimea and besieged the naval base of Sevastopol, which fell after a group. And of course we know that that's the Crimean War, which is a pretty famous war. Um, but I'm sure we'll do more, more, you know, more videos on in the future. Which fell after a grueling year-long siege. In the Baltic, 
British and French warships blockaded the Russian capital, St. Petersburg. Russia was forced to sign a humiliating peace, withdraw its forces from the Black Sea, and put on hold plans for further southern expansion. Nicholas I was succeeded by his son, Alexander II. The Crimean War had exposed Russia's weakness. The country lagged far behind its European rivals in industry, infrastructure and military power. So Alexander, unlike his father, decided to embrace reform. The most obvious sign of Russia's backwardness was serfdom. According to the 1857 census, more than a third of Russians were serfs, forced to work their master's land with few rights, restrictions on movement and their status passed down to their children. They were slaves in all but name. In 1861, Alexander II abolished serfdom in Russia. He was hailed as the liberator. But in reality, most former serfs remained trapped in servitude and poverty. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, he freed everyone, but he also uh, made a promise to all of the aristocrats that, you know, essentially owned them, that you guys essentially have to work off your freedom. So you're not, you're free, but you're not really free. So it was backhanded as hell. Most former serfs remained trapped in servitude and poverty. Alexander's reforms would continue with the creation of the Zemtsva, provincial assemblies with authority over local affairs, including education and social welfare. In the Far East, Russia forced territorial concessions from a weakened China, leading to the founding of Vladivostok, Russia's major Pacific port. Another uprising by Poles and Lithuanians against Russian rule was once more crushed by the Russian army. In the Caucasus, Russia's long and brutal war against local tribes came to an end, with their leaders swearing oaths of loyalty to the Tsar. Yeah, but we even know that that doesn't last as long, I think. Because I think um, during in, in the revolution, they they wanted um, well states down there broke off, and then uh, no Chechnya and Dagestan definitely want to break off. But yeah, I know that's a whole thing, especially in the nineties. But yeah, leaders swearing oaths of loyalty to the Tsar. In Central Asia, the Russian Empire was gradually expanding southwards. Russian armies defeated the Emirate of Bukhara and the Khanate of Kiva. And by the 1880s, Russia had conquered most of what was then called Turkestan, today the countries of Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. Imperial rivalry in Central Asia between Russia and Britain led to the Great Game, a 19th century version of the Cold War. Centered on Afghanistan, Diplomats and spies on both sides tried to win local support, extend their own influence, and limit the expansion of their rival, while avoiding direct military confrontation. Yeah, but we also know that the, I think around that same time, uh, Britain was also uh, fighting with China and the Opium Wars and all that stuff, so I want to say. While avoiding direct military confrontation, Russia decided to sell Alaska to America for $7.2 million. Many Americans thought it was a waste of money. Gold and oil were only discovered there much later. Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace was published, still regarded as one of the world's greatest works of literature. The late 19th century was a cultural golden age for Russia, a period of literary greats and outstanding composers. Russia, in support of nationalist revolts in the Balkans against Ottoman rule, went to war with the Ottoman Empire once more. Russian troops crossed the Danube, 
Then, with Bulgarian help, fought to secure the vital Shipka Pass. Then they launched a bloody five-month siege of Plevna in Bulgaria. Russia and her allies finally won victory, with their troops threatening Constantinople itself. But at the Congress of Berlin, Russia bowed to international pressure and accepted limited gains in a settlement that also led to independence for Romania, Serbia, Montenegro, and later, Bulgaria. Meanwhile... Yeah, so obviously we can see that, you know, obviously they didn't care about the Ottoman Empire, they just wanted to be able to build up the European suits that you know, needed their independence and stuff. Montenegro, and later, Bulgaria. Meanwhile, within Russia, Radical political groups were increasingly frustrated by Alexander II's limited reforms. There were several failed attempts to assassinate the Emperor, but as he prepared to approve new constitutional reforms, he was killed in St. Petersburg by a bomb thrown by members of the People's Will, one of the world's first modern terrorist groups. This act of violence would lead only to a new era of repression. Did you know all... All right, guys, I'll go ahead and end it right there. So yeah, pretty crazy to see. Uh, I think what we're like two or... Actually, I think our next one has... Um, is about to have our, uh, you know, war one and um, start of uh, the revolution and stuff like that. With that being said, we're going to end. Uh, thank you again for joining me on another episode of uh, Mike's Intellectual Corner. I'll see you guys on another one. I'm out. Peace.